First, second, third John, uh, great little books. Uh, this is a text that has come uh, as a result of a situation that took place in the first century. It seems, uh, we don't know fully all that's going on, but it seems that John is responding to something that is taking place in the early church, something that seems negative. He makes comments like this within the text, 1 John 2, first part of verse 19. They went out from us. Who are the they? I don't know, but somebody left them. Somebody was a part of the assembly, and now somehow there's another denomination, if you want to say it that way. Something's going on, and people are asking, are they with us or not with us? What's, are they the same as us? What's happening here? John says it this way. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. Something's going on. There seems to be a problem, and people are beginning to question and ask, um, what does that mean? Is everybody a Christian who just claims to be a Christian? Those people over there, they used to be here, and now they're there, and they're kind of teaching the same as us, but not always, and we're not really sure what's going on. It was the first time in history that this kind of thing began to take place. We see it more commonly, of course, by now, 2,000 years after the fact, but initially it was quite a surprise. So John was responding, <clears throat> and the book of 1 John is really a book of tests. How do you know that you know that you are really a believer? What is the test that you can give to somebody else or to yourself to know that you know that you actually believe? This morning he outlines what I would describe simply as the behavior test. If you don't meet this test, then I would say politely, you should question your own claim on knowing Christ. Claiming to know Christ is not an issue of head knowledge. It is not as an assent, an agreement. It is not because you grew up in an assembly, because you were taught some things as a child and you didn't walk away from them. It is not about um, just some formal outworking of some measure of an appearance of faith. It is far deeper than that. I've met many people who... Uh, say that they're Christians because they were born a Christian. If you haven't met someone like that, you just haven't lived long enough. If that's your state of affairs, you don't understand New Testament Christianity. John is drawing a line in this book, and he's saying there's actually a test that we can know that we know that someone believes. In fact, you can know that you know. You should have assurance. One of the early church issues, we, we believe this is what John is responding to within this book, is an issue called Gnosticism. I don't know if you've heard this word, Gnosticism. It comes from uh, the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge, or to know something. And there was an, uh, a, a, a sect, if you will, in the, in the early church that taught and believed that real tuning into God was about you tuning in with your own mind. That God was found by you finding the mystical place of getting your answers. Gnosticism as a cult still exists today. It is far less prominent than it was in the early first century church, but it still exists. In fact, I have gleaned some of the catechism, if that's the word to use, from a current Gnostic um, website. If you're interested to know what Gnosticism t still teaches and taught in the first century, this gives you a flavor of what John was dealing with. Most likely, uh, one of the things that he was dealing with within the, first, uh, the book of 1 John. Gnosis, that is knowledge. Gnosis, this is how you come to everything. Gnosis is the relevatory and salvific knowledge. What did I just read? It is it is, it's something that has to come from outside of you. It is revealed to you, clearly, revel, revelatory. And salvific means related to salvation. So there's a knowledge that you need to receive if you're going to be saved. This is what it is. Gnosis is the revelatory sal and salvific knowledge of who we were, of what we have become, of where we were, of wherein we have been thrown, of where to we are hastening, of what we are being freed, of what birth really is, and of what rebirth really is. Oh, thank you. That really helps me. I have no idea what I just read to you. I am just repeating what the website said, and this is Gnosticism at its core. You are looking for the mystical, deeper truth for all of these answers, and you can do this with your mind. God is present 
in the human being in a very special way, for the spirit in man contain, contains God's effective presence. This is also called, at times, called Christ in us, described by St. Paul as our hope of glory. That is a radical statement, but needless to say, that is Gnosticism. God is present in a very special way. The spirit of man contains the effective presence of God. One comes to divine gnosis. You want to really tune in. You want to really meet with God. You want to come to divine knowledge. You come by divine grace combined with sincere and informed human aspiration. I don't know what that means any more than you do. You work up to it. You try to tune into it. You try to find somebody who's more enlightened than you. You try to find some answers. You're working yourself, but it has to come from outside of you. And you're working to find the greater truth. By the way, the greater truth is never really delineated. The greater truth is whatever truth you come to that yours is true for you. How convenient is that? Salvation is brought about neither by faith, belief in God or Christ, nor by works, performance of good deeds, but by gnosis. Salvation ultimately is you reaching a place of greater knowledge of the mystical being we call God. We are to be saved first from ignorance, which prevents us from knowing our true source, our real nature, our condition, and our destiny. We shall be saved from the burden of earthly existence with its attendant conditions of suffering and exile from our true home. So, salvation has nothing to do with the cross of Christ. It has nothing to do with your sinful state. It has nothing to, you, to do with you being reconciled to a holy God. It has everything to do with you being educated and reaching a place where you can understand the real truth of who you are and you really understand. In fact, Jesus' physical death was merely a tragic incident in the sublime drama of his life. This is a teaching of Gnosticism. So in the early church, this kind of teaching began to flourish and it became a thing. And people were actually taking up the name of Jesus and talking about the great being and talking about God and getting to know God. And it was confusing people. They're talking about Jesus. They're talking about God. They're talking about knowing God. They're talking about finding God. Are they with us or are they not with us? What's going on with that? And John sat down to write a book to divide the lines to know who's in, who's out. Let me read to you just uh, this final one. Gnosticism. Grace is the effective manifestation of the supernal life of God appearing to us as a supernatural gift of God bestowed on us through Gnosis and also other means. I don't know what I'm reading to you. I'm just reading Gnosticism. It sounds like it's saying something. Sounds important. It sounds mystical. It sounds deep. But it's nonsense. Because our minds can never find God. We know this Christianity 101. You can do nothing in and of yourself with your own mind, human mind, to find salvation. Salvation comes to us as a revelation. Yes, your mind is enlightened to that revelation. But you in and of yourself will never find a way, a means of reaching God. This is clear in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 20 to 21. Where is the scribe, or who is the wise, the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Who's the one who's written down the path to God? Who's the one to figure out how to find God? Who is the debater of this age? Who's got the argument, the ultimate solution to finding God and finding peace with God? There isn't one. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. The gospel is foolishness. The person standing on the corner saying, you are a sinner and you need Jesus as your savior, looks like a buffoon in the eyes of the world. Because the message is ridiculous. And God in his wisdom has chosen to use the thing that in the eyes of the world is absolutely despised, ridiculous, foolishness as the very means of bringing salvation to people. The very thing they reject because in our minds, I don't need that nonsense. I can find God on my own. 
I can do this thing. And it's never true that you can do this thing. You will never, you can never. Human ingenuity will never find a way to God. We are born dead to him, away from him, separated from him, with no way to find him, except he in his mercy enlightens our hearts to recognize there is a way to him, and it is through Jesus. 1 Corinthians 22, 24, Jews demand signs. Greeks seek wisdom. This is the way they were going to find God. How do we know the way to God? This is what we're looking for. This is how we're going to do it. But we preach Christ crucified. Stumbling block to Jews. They're not looking for that. They don't believe in Jesus. Foolishness, folly to the Gentiles. They're looking for some deeper wisdom. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Sorry, that's a little bit of an aside. But I wanted just to point out to you that in fact we have no way to God using our own minds. We impart a secret and hidden wisdom. First Corinthians 7 and 8, uh, chapter 2, 7 and 8. We impart a secret wisdom, hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the world for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this. They couldn't find this, this wisdom. They'd never seek it on their own. If they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So our minds will never lead us to God. That is Christianity 101, and it's one of the reasons Gnosticism fails before it even begins to stand up on its feet. But this was the issue. Sorry for going on about that, but just giving you some background. This is part of what is going on in the early church, that they are believing that somehow, maybe I can know God. Well, 1 John 2, 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Seems there was an issue that was going on, and this was part of Gnosticism. It certainly is that um, what you do in the body doesn't really matter. Only thing that matters is what you think and what you believe spiritually. So you can believe in God, you can believe that Jesus was important, that he was enlightened, that he can help you, but how you live and how you behave is absolutely irrelevant. So if you want to be whatever you want to do, be immoral in whatever way, live whatever lifestyle you choose, you are free to do so. Because Within the realm of Gnosticism, you can believe in God, know that Jesus was the enlightened one, accept him as the one who can help you to find God, and all the same things that sound good, but at the same time live any way you want. And the church was confused. And John is saying very plainly, look, I'm writing to you because there is something intrinsic in the gospel that causes the person's life not to sin. This is not declaring perfectionism. This is not declaring that you will never sin ever again. This is declaring that the gospel intrinsically, when it takes root in a person's life, I am writing this so you understand this, so that you will not be the person who lives the lifestyle of sin. The gospel, by definition, changes your heart, changes your disposition, changes your thinking, and draws you away from those things you loved. I'm writing these things so that you may not sin. By the way, this um, is written, the, the Greek form of this, not to get technical here, is not that you will never sin. It's kind of uh, assumed that you might sin. It even says, but if anyone sins, that's kind of, in English we might say, but if and when. It's not if as if, well, it's possible you wouldn't. It really has the idea that if anyone does sin, you, your lifestyle should be such that it doesn't. But, but understand this. It is not realistic to go through life believing that you never will. But you always believe you never should. But if anyone does sin, one of the greatest verses we have in all of the New Testament, we have an advocate with the Father. An advocate. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Do you know the word advocate? This word, it just means somebody who, is, it's kind of a legal term. Sort of a lawyer kind of aspect to it is someone who stands beside you in court, giving support to someone making a claim, settling dispute, responding to a charge. We have an advocate. Can I just remind you, um, just kind of as an aside, but also an important uh, aspect of our Christian walk. Sometimes we don't feel saved. Sometimes we don't feel forgiven. Sometimes we wonder if our emotions are telling us the truth 
of how we should believe about our spiritual state. There comes a point where you, by faith, have to trust what the Word of God says. Your feelings can come, will arrive, will bring that solution as you begin to rest on truth. We have an advocate. It's not about how you feel, it's about how you respond to your sinful state. If you know you are wrong before God, you come to this verse and you say, I have a lawyer who is going to plead my case before God. And by faith, I am asking that lawyer to stand before the righteous judge and plead my case that I can only be defended because Jesus died for me. And my case is only coming because Jesus said that if I come through him, I could be him coming, pleading that that lawyer would come, and by faith, we receive that forgiveness. Your feelings sometimes take a while to catch up to truth, but we live by truth and not by feelings. There are days, if I can say, when you probably, if you're married here, probably don't feel married. You just wake up and you get going with your day. And you don't say, boy, I really feel married today. But there are moments when you remember, oh yeah, I am. Because your behavior reflects the fact of the matter. And that is really the case that comes down to this text. It's all about behavior that is the test. Again, that was just a bit of an aside. Sorry for ranting. But it is an important point for us to remember that we stand by faith on that truth, and our feelings uh, will follow, can follow, and sometimes don't follow because we are disobedient, and I'll talk about that again in a few minutes. What you're looking at is the text uh, that was written in the 1800s, I'm not sure the year, um, uh, Charity Lee's Bancroft wrote this very important, uh, very well-known text um, that was originally called, originally titled, The Advocate. She's actually from Southern Ireland, which is an amazing thing, considering uh, the spiritual state of Southern Ireland. But again, this was many years ago. You know these words. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there by faith. Upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. To look on him and pardon me. You know this hymn as before the throne of God above. We sing this upon occasion. This, this, this is the second stanza. Amazing words. It's not about your feelings. It's about the truth that we stand on, that we have an advocate. When Satan tempts me, when my doubts are there, he tells me of the guilt that I have. He reminds me of my sinful state. I look by faith to my advocate, and I recognize that, in fact, that's the truth, and there's nothing my feelings can do about that. The verse, second verse tells us this from 1 John 2. He is the propitiation for our sins. This is why he is our advocate. This is the sacrifice that satisfies the wrath of God. He is the one who is the one who is our substitute for our sins. And not for ours only. Sometimes this text has been taken as a universal truth, or rather to, uh, to uh, teach a universal doctrine, a doctrine of, of universalism, that everybody is saved. If you've been to a, a funeral in some other liberal denominations, I'll refrain from naming them. You know um, what, that they're out there and that they exist. You would believe that absolutely anybody who anybody, anybody uh, shows up in heaven just because of being who they are. That God is obligated to them in some way, that they've done enough good things, that somehow God, they've got God uh, in their good books, and he has to do this, and he, he has no choice about it, and he, they're in. Everybody's in. Why is everybody in? The book says. And not for ours only, but he died for the sins of the whole world. Is that what the text means? That is not what the text means. The early uh, ideas of gods, as you are probably aware, are often very geographic. If you were battling on the hills, you had to appease the god of the mountains. If you were battling in the plains, you had to make sure that your army commander had appeased the god of the plains. 
If you were going to battle on the sea, you had to appease the gods of the sea. If you needed something to happen, you had to appease the god of that particular geographic situation. But this is different. Christianity is entirely unique. Christianity makes a claim that there is one God, and that God covers all of the entire earth, every race, every tribe, every skin color, every nationality, every citizenship. It is regardless of where you're from and who you are, this God covers the sins of the whole world. Anybody who will come to him, anybody who will repent, that is the essence of this text. It is died for the sins of everybody. This makes Christianity, the, this is where we get our claim, that there is one solution for the sins of the entire world. He has died for the sins of the world. This is the gospel message. It is ultimately the, this doesn't sound trite and corny to say, the universal spiritual health care. It is Christ and Christ alone. Verse 3. By this we know. How do we know that we know? Is it because we've invited Jesus into our heart? And we prayed some prayer somewhere along the way? That I've asked Jesus to forgive me? Is that how we know? No. This is what the text says. We know that we have come to know him. How are you going to compare yourself to those people out there who claim they know him? How do you know that your profession is genuine and authentic? Your mother told you when you were four years old, some of you in this room, that you received Christ as your Savior. And you don't even have a memory of it. All you have is what your mother told you that you said. And you wonder your whole life if you're actually in or you're out. How do you know that you have come to know him? If we keep his commandments. Simple. If you keep his commandments, look at your lifestyle. By the way, do you see John's specific use of the word no? He is responding to the Gnostics who have deeper knowledge, who have mystical insight, who've got the real way to find God. How do you know that you know? John says, this is how we really know. This is where knowledge comes from. It comes from your behavior. It comes from your actions. It comes from the way you live your life. Obedience to Christ is the result of true knowledge of God. In fact, this is exactly what Jesus taught, the very same thing. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Um, have you ever had somebody live at your house for a little while, a guest or something along the lines? Maybe it's an extended visit, um, and they're there for a few days, a few weeks, a long time. Have you ever noticed that your, kind of your routine has to change because somebody else is now living at your house you know, it's just, it's fine, you accept it, you understand it, but things aren't the same. Suddenly you're worried about whether you've got supper on in time, before it, just eat whenever you wanted to eat. Now you're worried about getting a menu and getting to the store, and I have to be home on time, and this person's going to be there, and, and things change. Somebody's living in your home. Somebody's there. Somebody's visiting. You're trying to make plans with your holidays, and you're trying to connive time off work, and things change. Why? Because somebody has taken up residence in your house. Maybe it's a weak example. But let me just say it this way. When Jesus takes up residence in a person's life, things change. And you get pushed out to the side. Your desires suddenly become second place. You suddenly become less of the central stage of all that has to happen in your life. Suddenly there's somebody else that you are thinking of and caring for and serving and being obedient to and watching over and suddenly things have changed. Let me just say it this way. If nothing has ever changed in your life, you are still the center of your universe. You are the reason you get up in the morning. You are the reason that you have a bank account. You are the reason that you come to church on Sunday so that you can be seen, so that you can learn something, so that you can feel better about yourself, so that you are still the center of all things. And Jesus really does take, continually take second place. If you love me, you will keep 
my commands. That's not harsh. That's just a statement of fact. When Christ takes up residence in your heart, there's an automatic change of disposition. There's an automatic want to in a person's spirit. There's something that changes gears in their heart, and suddenly they are not center stage. Suddenly there's somebody else that they love, somebody else that they want to please, somebody else that they're living for. And if this is not your ongoing lifestyle, John is very plainly saying, you're not in. John 14, verse 21, whoever has Jesus' words, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. There will be a relationship. You are going to know God and know Christ. One of the reasons, if I can say, that we doubt our own salvation is because we are living our lives in disobedience. We are too often pushing Christ out of our lives, and we are not putting him center stage. And when obedience comes into our lives, suddenly the realization that he is mine and I am his becomes real. There is no further place to go with this, in this regard than the simple step of baptism. I know this is a hot button for a lot of people, but I personally have a hard time understanding how it is that somebody on the one hand can say, I am following Christ, and on the same, in the same sentence say, I'm not ready to be baptized. Let me think about it. What is there to think about? This should be a natural inclination in the heart of the person who wants to obey the Christ who says, if you follow me, you will be baptized. To me, it is a no-brainer. If you are his, then obviously you are going to do the thing he's called you to do. And when you refuse to do it, what kind of a claim are you making to know him? You're not even doing the very first fundamental, foundational, most obvious thing that he's called you to do. Now, is it possible to be baptized and not following Christ? Absolutely so. That is why we try to have a conversation with you before baptism to make sure that your motives are right, you understand what's going on. Again, that's an aside, but something to put in your craw. If it's been irritating you that we're on your, down your back about it, I just want to tell you I'm not down your back. I'm just waiting for you to respond to that command. John 14, 23, 24, just to underline this further. Jesus answered them, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. This is the essence of Christianity. This is how you know that you have a relationship with God. If you are obedient to him, if you're not living your, for yourself on whatever level, yes, we all stumble. Yes, we all fall. Yes, nobody's perfect. We have an advocate with the Father. But the disposition of your heart is to follow Christ, is to chase after him, is to be obedient to him. You have a relationship with him. He with you and you with him. He will come and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. Whoever doesn't love me just doesn't obey me. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commands, 1 John 2, 4, is a liar. That's just an empty profession. There's just no reality to it. I don't know how many of you have um, ever taught children or been around with a group of kids, and you may be teaching a lesson, maybe you've been a school teacher. Um, and the younger the kids, the more they react this way. That You, you ask a question, hands go up. And I've had this more than once. You, you say, yes. Oh, um, I, I forgot. You forgot? What kind of a lame excuse back out is that? When a kid says, I've had this many times. I've done a lot of children's stuff. I love working with kids. Kid goes, I, I forgot. I, I just say, you forgot what? That your hand is up? No, no, I, 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 I forgot. I forgot. I don't know. What don't you know? What, you don't know what you forgot? Like, I just let, I don't let the kid off the hook. I just can't let that go. <laughs> if you're going to be a faker, if you're going to pretend that you're just sticking your hand up because you want to look smart and you don't want to look like you don't know and you want to fit in with everybody else, I'm not letting that go. This kid's going to 
I'm going to be humiliated. Ah, heads up. I'm going to let everybody know you're a faker. You're a liar. You are just going through the motions. Is it possible for you to go through the motions of obedience? Yes, it is. It is possible for you to, with a wooden spirit, show up in church on Sunday, sing songs, give money, do all your motions, pretend on the outside, do everything that you think is obedient, and you are nothing more than a Faker, it is possible for you to, on the appearance, look like you are walking in obedience. But the truth of the matter is, your heart is not changed if your obedience doesn't come from a desire for obedience. You know, your obedience is just a wooden thing on the outside. It's a bunch of rules. It's a bunch of legalistic, I don't do this and I don't do that. And you look at somebody else who's doing that thing and you're like, man, I wish I could do that, but I can't do that because I'm a good Christian. If you have a hunger to look at somebody else and you feel jealous of their sin and you can't participate in that sin, what motivation is that? To be obedient to Christ. Yes, oh, we're always tempted. Yes, we always fall. You're going to wrestle in your own spirit with this. But I'm asking you the question, what motivates your obedience? What motivates you to follow Christ? Is it just because you've fallen into a Christian routine? And I guess I'm not supposed to do this. And I guess I'm supposed to do that. And I guess I'm supposed to be holy. And I, I suppose if I have to... Really, we respond to Christ out of a love for Christ. And if your response to him in loving his commands, in loving his obedience, is not a genuine heart response, a knee-jerk reaction response, you're a liar. He's a liar. You're a faker. You're sticking your hand up and you have no idea what the answer is. You just don't want to look like you don't know anything. You're just pretending. That is a frightening place to be. But may the Spirit of God open the eyes of those who think they know that they know and they don't. He verbally says he knows Christ. Theologically believes that you can live in sin and still be connected to Christ. He's lying. He's lying practically. He lives like he knows the truth. This, to know Christ means that you deny yourself, you take up your, his cross. It means that you are in a relationship with him where prayer is actually something that you functionally do. It's not something you have to do. It's something you desire to do. Now, I know we all struggle to pray. It's not something we always love to do. But at your core, the heart of hearts of who you are, if you never come to a to a prayer meeting, your own prayer meeting or somebody else's. I, I just got to wonder. Like you, you're reading the Bible, you have no interest. It, it's, it's a zero on the excitement scale. I mean, I know it's a tough book. I realize it's dense. I know it's, it has its challenges. But there's something in the believer's heart that hungers for a relationship with God that is real. And they know that it's found in the Word of God and prayer. And they know they're willing to labor for it. I know none of us are perfect in this. But if you never, you've got to just be honest with yourself. If it's not who you are, if it's not what you do, are you a faker? I mean, I'm just asking. I'm not trying to make you doubt your salvation. I'm trying to, by the Spirit of God, may He sift us to be genuine. This is not a game. You are going to stand before God. And he is going to weigh your life. And it's not a game where you can just dial in and let's just pull the trigger and see what happens. We actually can know that we know. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. Don't let this verse bother you. This is not a call to perfectionism. The Wesleyans actually initially taught this. Sometimes it's even still taught today, although it's pretty much 
eradicated that a, a Christian can reach a point, a place in their own spiritual life where they actually reach a place where they will never sin and do not sin. Okay, that's a heresy. We don't teach that. I, I would label that a heresy, although it's taught in Christian churches. Uh, it's kind of a side issue, but it's, this is the verse that's gone to. This is not what the verse means. Per, the word perfected here means it reached its fulfillment, its full accomplishment. Whoever keeps my word... In him truly, the love of God is truly and fully, absolutely manifest. It is accomplished. This is what God is trying to do. He is changing your heart so that you desire to serve him, to love him, to follow him, to obey him. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way Jesus walked. Simple. You want to know the test? There's a behavior test. You want to test the Gnostics? Go look at their lifestyle. How do they live? They claim to know him, but they live any way they want. John says it's obvious they're out. And he's also calling anybody in the church who thinks they know, who thinks they've signed a card, walked an aisle, prayed a prayer, whatever thing you've done in the past that your mother told you about. Don't believe your profession of faith on the basis of anything other than your own heart knowledge of who you are. It's a hard thing. It's a tough thing to wrestle through. Some of us struggle with our assurance, and there's nothing wrong with struggling. But this is how we know. Obedience. What does it mean to walk the way that Jesus walked? Let me try to wrap this up. He walked in service. Do you serve the Lord? Do you love serving the Lord? Do you deny yourself to serve the Lord? I mean, this is just a natural outflow. He served. He, he lived for the Father's will. I mean, all the way through the Gospels. I just want to do what God has called me to do. You're not worried about you. You're worried about Him. It's just a question. I know we all fail. I know we struggle. And if the Spirit of God is pricking your heart because you're a believer and you're not that way, that is evidence that you are a believer. We all, he walked in fellowship with him. I don't understand how believers can be at odds with other believers. I know sometimes we don't get along fully with other people. Yes. But to leave something lingering, to leave a grudge, to hold a bitterness, this is not Christianity. And if you are willing to live live full-time in sin, in the sin of bitterness, in the sin of unforgiveness for something else, or, or an unwillingness to let something go. I mean, I'm just saying. This is an evidence that you don't know him. Fellowship with each other is just as important as our fellowship with God. And fellowship with God, I mean, this is where we find our joy. This is where we find our satisfaction. Why are we so miserable as Christians? We're not living in obedience with him. We don't care anything about actually walking with him. We're only concerned with our own lives. We give no evidence that we're actually sincerely surrendering our hearts and confessing our sin and dying to ourselves. And then we wonder, why is my Christianity such a doldrum? Why is it such hard work? Why is there no joy? Are you walking with him? Because he is our source of joy. And in obedience, he walked in obedience, submission to the Word of God. So you hear the Word of God on a Sunday morning, and what does that do for you? Makes you feel nice? Hopefully you'll get through your week without, you know, a little something to, to gnaw on. What is the Word of God to you? Does it change your heart? Does it change you and say, this is how I have to live? This is what I need to do? This is how I need to behave? There is a test that John has given to us that we can know that we know. And the first step is the behavior test. He who walks with him must walk, who claims to know him must walk as Jesus did.